Welcome to Quantum Mechanics, a powerful framework for understanding the universe. Hello everybody, welcome back. Now we're going to start Chapter 2, Dynamics of a Quantum Particle. And that means we're going to have to start out by talking about the Schrodinger equation. So you've seen bits and pieces of what make up the Schrodinger equation, but we haven't gone, in it, gone into it in a great deal of detail, and now we're going to do that. So it's a linear partial differential equation in d space dimensions plus time. Okay, it's got some constants in it. h bar is h over 2 pi. h is Planck's constant. m is the mass. And I is, usual, as usual, the, the um, imaginary unit. We're going to be looking at the dynamics of a single particle. So this is just for one particle of mass m. So the left-hand side you've seen previously, and it looks like, well, it is, the operator representation of the total energy, kinetic plus potential. And look back at earlier lectures from Chapter 1 and convince yourself of that fact. Okay, so I've included some some references on where on the history of Schrodinger's equation. I'm not going to go into that in much detail. Schrodinger's original paper is really worth taking a look at. It's, it's, you should not have too much trouble understanding most of it. The book by Stone is excellent and I highly recommend it. It's a very enjoyable read and tells you a great deal about the history of quantum mechanics and how the, and the intellectual struggle that led to the Schrodinger equation amongst other things. But we're going to be taking Feynman, Richard Feynman's um, approach in some sense and just uh, his famous quote is, where, do we, where did we get that equation from? Nowhere. It is not possible to derive it from an, anything you know. It came out of the mind of Schrodinger. So we're going to proceed from that point. All right. So this equation, going back to this, the unknown is, psi, is the function psi of r and t. r is space. It's going to be one, two, or three dimensional. Mostly we're going to be dealing with one dimensional dynamics in this course. It's complex valued, like quantities are in quantum mechanics, and it's referred to as the wave function. This is a wave equation, as we will see when we look at specific examples where we can solve this. But in order to solve this, we need to know what the potential energy function is. Now, if you think of Schrodinger's equation as the quantum mechanical analog of Newton's equation, the equation of the motion, you need to know the forces on the particle in order to specify the mechanical uh, setting so that you can you know, define the equations and solve them, or understand them at least. Okay, it, it's similar here. that We need to know the potential energy, or the force, on the quantum particle. Well, that's, gonna, that, that's, that's really a crucial aspect. Right now, we've written down the potential energy generally as a function of space and time. Now, the easiest possible potential energy that we could look at is when the potential energy is zero. And that's called a free particle. Free. No forces on it. We're going to look at that um, situation in some detail. It's a very important situation. Um, but in general, we're going to consider the potential energy independent of time. The case when it's depends on time is important and interesting, but uh, this is a place we start. Okay, in that case, the Schrodinger equation can be expressed in terms of separation of variables in a nice form. So we're going to assume that the wave function, psi of r and t, is the product of two functions, one depending only on space and the other depending only on time. We substitute that into the equation 
and we get all the space dependence on the left side, all the time dependence on the right side. And if those are going to be equal, uh, some function of space equals some function of time, they have to be equal to the same constant. We're going to call that E for energy, as we will see later on. So we set them both equal to E, and it separates into two equations. Time dependent part is trivial. We can solve that immediately, and it's uh, some initial condition f of zero e to the minus i e over h bar times t. The spatial spatial dependent part is more complicated, as you might expect, because that's the part that involves the potential energy that doesn't depend on time, and we refer to it as the time independent Schrodinger equation. Now, when the wave function is expressed in this form as the as a spatially dependent term, phi of r, times a time dependent term, e to the minus i e over h bar t, we refer to that as a stationary state. Even though it does depend on time, we'll see why we refer to it as, as a stationary state shortly. Now, we want to look at the time independent Schrodinger equation a bit more closely because we can see that that's where the difficulty will lie in solving the Schrodinger equation when the potential energy function is independent of time. So let's look at the map that sends phi of r to this object. That is a linear operator. On what space? L2 of d, the square integral functions on the domain d, spatial domain d, with the inner product that we've already defined. Okay, that's an eigenvalue problem. Now, we've, well, an eigenvalue problem when we try to solve it for all possible values of E, the separation constant. I'll come back to that in a second. Okay, now, this is a self-adjoint linear operator. We've actually proven that the right-hand side is a self-adjoint operator back in Chapter 1. We're going to do it again in a slightly different form, but then we'll go back and compare with what we did in Chapter 1. Okay, but we've proven that self-adjoint operators have real eigenvalues. That's true in this case. And they have a complete set of eigenvectors. That means the eigenvectors span L2 of d. Now, we, haven't, we only prove that in finite dimensions. We're going to take it as a fact that it's proved for this particular Hilbert space, L2 of d. And we denote the eigenvector eigenvalue pairs in this way, phi k of r, comma ek. Now, the index k is, k is indicative of something that's discrete. We are going to take it as discrete now. We'll examine that a bit later on, but the general wave function can be represented as a linear combination of the eigenfunctions of the time independent Schrodinger equation where the coefficients ck of t depend upon time. Now what we're going to do is to express this, get a cleaner expression for this, we're going to substitute it into the equation the full, fully time-dependent Schrodinger equation. We're going to collect together terms on the different basis elements, phi k. Equate the coefficients on the different basis elements. And we're going to get the following form for the solution of the time-dependent Schrodinger equation. A sum over the eigenstates of the time-independent Schrodinger equation where the coefficients have this nice form that we've already derived and the ek are the eigenvalues of the time-independent Schrodinger equation eigenvalue problem. Okay, there's a lot in there. I've given you the path to where we want to get to with this problem. You should go back and work through the details on your own. There's some things I've asked you to accept. Now, there are certain physical requirements that we're going to demand for a solution. A 
of the Schrodinger equation to be to be physical. We're going to want the uh, function to be continuous, uh, single value. There will be some conditions imposed on it just by the structure of the partial differential equation. If the potential energy varies in space, we're going to want the partial derivatives to vary continuously across boundaries between different values. We'll see that when we look at things like uh, um, motion over a step potential, for example. But these are generally our pretty mild assumptions that we need. We're going to use them in solving certain problems, but generally we're just going to proceed. Recall earlier on, we just, you know, when we wanted equations to, uh, or solutions to, to obey in a, per, obey a particular condition in order that some physical circumstance be satisfied, we just demanded that, reg, that uh, solutions that are realistic satisfy that condition like vanishing at infinity when the solution is defined or the wave function is defined on the entire real line. Now there's a little section I have down here about parity and parity operators. I, that's useful to know about. I am and I included it only for one dimension. We're not going to use that a lot but it or, or at all practically. But I just include it here because it does come up, and it's important to considering boundary conditions, the the, the, the uh, behavior of particular uh, eigenfunctions of the time-independent Schrodinger equation. I'm going to leave that for you to read, but don't spend a lot of time on it at the moment. So that's it for the moment. That's all I want to talk about now. Next time we're going to talk about what the wave function means, how we interpret it, and that's a very interesting story. So, I'll leave you with that, and as always, I'll be available for questions that you might want to ask about the notes, but this is the, um, this is the uh, path I want you to go through at the beginning of chapter two, and we'll pick up on that next time. Okay, bye everybody.